much for um, uh, your grace uh, in Jesus Christ. Thank you for this opportunity that I have to study First Chronicles. Father, help us to um, uh, learn from First Chronicles together and receive one word and keep it in our hearts. Father, please uh, give me um, uh, your grace, cover my weaknesses, and uh, help me to depend on the Holy Spirit. Uh, thank you for this time, and I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I have a disclaimer. Um, I made this through Prezi um, on like a month ago, and for Prezi, apparently you have to pay. So I did the seven-day trial, so I had to make this in seven days. But then after my trial ended, it's really expensive. It's like two hundred USD. So instead of paying, like I tried to finish it in the seven days, but after I finished it, I learned a lot more things. So I couldn't update it. Um, and also I was very busy, so I didn't have time to make a PowerPoint, a new one. So I'm really sorry, but not everything is on the slides. So focus here too. So I'll, I'll say more than that than is on the slides. Um, I'll try to make it as clear as possible, but um, yeah, and some things get switched around, but I'll explain. So, uh, through First and Second Samuel and First and Second Kings, we learned about the history of Israel and Judah, focusing particularly on the events of King David. We learned that he was a great man of God that sought to know God's heart. But we also saw that he was not perfect, nor were any of the kings that came after him. First and Second Chronicles recount similar events, but from a perspective of the hope of God. So, introduction. Although the author of Chronicles is not explicitly mentioned, he is traditionally known to be um, either a priest slash Levite or Ezra. According to the events recorded in this book, um, scholars deduce that Chronicles was written sometime during the Persian era, which is uh, between 539 and 332 BC after the people returned from the exile to Babylon. So we can imagine that the Israelites were very fatalistic and full of despair at this time because they were stripped of their identity as God's people while they were in Babylon. So in this context, the author of Chronicles wrote with the intention of replanting um, God's hope in his people and by reminding them of their covenant identity as his chosen people. So let's go deeper into the study of First Chronicles against this theme, uh, the hope of God and renewing uh, identity as his people. So First Chronicle focuses on the reign of King David, and then Second Chronicles is kings after him. It is distinct from First and Second Samuel and First and Second Kings because it paints a very positive image of David. He's as almost a um, sinless king. For example, there's no mention of David's uh, sleeping with Bathsheba and also his conspiracy against Uriah, who is uh, Bathsheba's wife, uh, husband. This is not to deceive readers about David, but it was meant to present David as the foreshadow of God's promised Savior King to come, Jesus, who is actually sinless. The big picture message of this book revolves around topic three. Um, God's promises to David. So in chapter 17, God makes two promises to David through his prophet Nathan. So first, that God would make his name like the names of the greatest men on earth, uh, specifically chapter 17, verse uh, 8. And second, that he would raise up David's offspring to establish his throne forever. He also, this would also be the one to build God's temple. And later we find out that's Solomon. So that's in verses 11 to 15. Actually, these two promises are one and the same. They foreshadow the coming of um, and dwelling of King Jesus as God incarnate and his kingdom would last forever. So the messianic king. We will soon see that Jesus is the hope of God, both for the Israelites and for us now. In him we find our true identity and fulfillment of a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Amen. So... You'll see that First Chronicles, I separated into five topics. So first, the forming of the nation of Israel uh, is discussed from chapters 
uh, 1 to 8, then establishing uh, David's kingdom, chapters 10 to 11 and 14, then God's promise to David in chapter 17, uh, then the example of David as king in chapters 13, 15, 16, 21, and 29, and then preparations for building the temple uh, from chapters 22 to the end, uh, chapter 29. So first, forming the nation of Israel. So the two promises I mentioned, uh, which form the core message of First Chronicles, concern the kingdom and the temple of Israel. We see that this focus on kings and priests is evident throughout the whole book, beginning with the genealogies. So the first eight chapters of First Chronicles trace the lineage from Adam to Israel, and then more focused on the lines of Judah, which are the kings, and then Levi, the priests, uh, from Israel to David. Although it seems pointless to record all these names, uh, we have to remember they are important and significant because they testify, as um, Petra said uh, about maps, they testify to the historical fact of Israel's nation building and also the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham. So chapter 1, uh, Adam to Israel, recounts um, uh, first the lineage from Adam to Noah, and then, if we zoom in on Noah, we see that um, from his line came, or he came from Seth's line, who God gave to Adam and Eve in place of Abel, whom uh, Cain killed. Then a bulk of chapter 1 focuses on the des descendants of um, Noah, sorry, Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Specifically, Abraham uh, came from the line of Shem after 10 generations. Uh, Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Esau and uh, Israel. Chapter 2 talks about the descendants of the 12 sons of Israel. So I'll focus on Judah and Levi because these are where um, the kings and the priests came from. And we see this theme running throughout First Chronicles. So first Judah. Actually, if you see Reuben, Reuben was the firstborn. Um, but since he defiled his father's marriage bed, this is talked about in chapter 5. Uh, the rights of the firstborn, it says the rights of the firstborn went to Joseph. Still though, it was not through Joseph, but through Judah's line that the kings of Israel came. Uh, and we can recall the faith of um, Tamar, Judah's daughter-in-law. Um, she disguised herself as a prostitute to continue Judah's line after her husband and her husband's father, uh, husband's brother, died. That's in Genesis 38. So here we see that through Tamar came Hezron and then Ram, Aminadab, Nashon, Simon, Boaz, Obed, Jesse, and then finally King David. And then. Uh, 1 Chronicles 3, 1-4 lists the names of David's children born to him in Hebron. In Hebron. And then verses 5-9, to nine, children born to David in Jerusalem, um, including Solomon, son of Bathsheba. So Levi, priestly line talked about in chapter 6. So Levi is the other important tribe of Israel. Levi was the father of Kohath, the grandfather of Aaron. Uh, from whom would come the priests of Israel. So interestingly, again, even though the Bible talks a lot about Moses, God did not choose Moses, uh, Moses to bring the Messianic king. But um, Moses and Joseph, they are um, still important ancestors of faith and key characters in God's plan. And it goes to show that while being related to Jesus by blood is privilege, um, it does not determine one's righteousness before God. In John 8, um, if you remember, the Jews were very proud of the fact that they were um, Abraham's descendants, but Jesus actually called them children of the devil. Children of the devil, yes, because um, they did not accept Christ. So as non-Jews, we are actually Gentiles. So as non-Jews, we can reason that we are not God's chosen people, but by faith in Christ, God has accepted us as righteous and as his children. So we are part of God's redemptive history by faith. 
second part is establishing God's kingdom. So I'll go through these um, events that describe establish, uh, the establishment of David's kingdom. So first, Saul ends his life in chapter 10. Then establishing his, David's kingdom, chapter 11, David, David's army grows like the army of God, chapter 12. David wins many battles. Um, these are described chapters 18 to 20, and then David's fame spreads, chapter 14. So chapter 8 to 10 talk about the genealogy of Saul as a transition point to David's kingdom. Saul was uh, actually a Benjamite. Though God, uh, through, uh, though God chose him, he is an example of one who did not maintain the grace of God. So he actually died a very sad death after being defeated by the Philistines in battle. So chapter 10, 13 to 14. Um, Matthias, can you read these verses? Saul died because he was unfaithful to the Lord. He did not keep the word of the Lord and even consulted the medium for guidance and did not inquire of the Lord. So the Lord put him to death and turned the kingdom over to David, the son of Jesus. Yes. So, the Bible talks quite a bit about Saul. Um, but it's so sad that he ended on this note. Like the Bible remembers him in this way. So, he died because he was unfaithful to the Lord and he did not keep the word of the Lord. So this is how, this is, um, how important it is to um, be faithful to God and his word the point of death. In a word, um, it was because Saul was self-seeking that he died. He could not be used by God because he did not seek God's kingdom or understand God's heart. Actually, humanly, he was very great. He was He's depicted as very noble and moral, but God saw beyond what people saw and found that he was unfaithful, disobedient, and self-reliant. So we really see what God values um, in the way Saul died. Second establishment of David's kingdom. All Israel uh, recognized David as their king according to God's promise. Amazingly, after Saul died, David was appointed and accepted as king by the people. They remembered God's promise to Samuel concerning David and crowned him their king. So chapter 11 verse 2 says, In the past, even while Saul was king, you were the one who led Israel on their military campaigns. And the Lord your God said to you, you will shepherd my people Israel and you will become their rulers. Uh, chapter 11 to 12 and chapter 14 are very happy chapters. They speak of the people's loyalty to David and the growth of his kingdom and army. So the Benjamites, Gadites, men of Manasseh and other Israelites uh, joined David in chapter 12. Men were happy to serve him as their king and fight for him. They were brave, loyal and full of integrity and uh, one example of such a fighter was Joab, who, whom David appointed as commander-in-chief. God made David a powerful king. So chapter 12, verse 22 says, Day after day, men came to help David until he had a great army, like the army of God. Later in chapters 14, 18, 19, and 20, we see that the Lord gave David victory in many battles. Um, so here David it summarized David defeated the Philistines it described in chapter 14 David defeated the kings of Zoba and Ar the Arameans chapter 18 David uh, also Joab is mentioned here defeats the Ammonites in chapter 19 and a repeated phrase in these chapters is the Lord gave David victory wherever he went so And then particularly after defeating the Philistine army, uh, chapter 14 verse 17 says, So David's fame spread throughout every land, and the Lord made all nations fear him. Third, God's promise to David. So these promises form the core messages of First Chronicles, the foreshadowing of the coming messianic King Jesus. The first promise, as I mentioned, is... Um, that uh, God would make David's name great. And the second promise is that David's son, not David, would be the one to build God's house, the temple. So 
the key verse I chose for First Chronicles is 17.11. So can we read this verse together? Okay, one, two, three. When your days are over and you go up, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, one of your own sons, and I will establish his throne forever. Yeah, and as I mentioned, the significance is the foreshadow of the coming of the Messianic King. The most important characteristic of this, prom of this promise is that uh, this king from David's line would reign eternally. So he would defeat all David's enemies absolutely. This was unimaginable for Israel who had just experienced captivity, captivity in Babylon for 70 years and had been defeated from, by many nations. But by giving this great promise, God wanted to renew their hope and identity as his chosen people. And we'll break there for five minutes. I'll go, I'll start right away. So David's, fourth, part four, David's example as king. So in part two, we thought about how God established David's kingdom and he won the hearts of many. Why did the people respect David so much? We see in various chapters from 13 to 29 that David was full of love for God and love for his people. Of course, David had many flaws, which we will see in chapter 21. But what is undeniable is his heart that sought after God's. He is the foreshadow of the kind of king Jesus is. So let's look at the um, examples, um, or David's exemplary kingship. So David brought, brings the ark of God to Jerusalem, chapters 13 and 15. And there we see David's praise and worship to God. Then David's prayer and life in chapter 16, and David's shepherd heart, chapters 21 and 29. So first, David's primary concern um, after becoming king was the Ark of God. Uh, we see this in chapters 13 and 15. He wanted to bring uh, the Ark of God back to Jerusalem, and he was careful to do so according to the word God had commanded to Moses. So chapters 15, uh, chapter 15, verse 15 says, and the Levites carried the Ark of God with the poles on their shoulders as Moses had commanded in accordance with the word of the Lord. So he taught the word of God. The Ark of God represents the presence of God. We know from the Psalms that David really desired to be in the presence of God. He prayed, uh, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. This was his uh, deep desire. God himself was David's joy and his reward. This is evident when David danced shamelessly before the ark to the point that Michal, his wife, despised him. So let's read uh, this verse together, chapter 15, verse 29. One, two, three. As the ark of the covenant of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michal, daughter of Saul, washed from a window, and when she saw King David dancing and celebrating, she despised him in her heart. We also see in David's prayer life that he was full of praise for who God is and what he had done both in, his, in history and in his own life. When he meditated on who God was, he could see himself humbly before God and simply thank him for uh, God's love. What is amazing is that though David was uh, successful in battle, had many material possessions, many beautiful wives and many children, still God's love was his greatest joy. So he says multiple times, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Amen. Also at the end of his reign, in chapter 29, we see that David gives thanks again for who God is. He was full of joy and thanks whenever he thought about who God is and what he had done. In this prayer, we see uh, David's great hope for his people and also for his son Solomon. That, and he prayed that the Lord would be the desire of their hearts. And that they would wholeheartedly devoted, be devoted to God's commands. In verses 20 to 22a of chapter 29, we see that all the people worshipped God and made sacrifices to God as David prayed for them, to, which shows David's godly influence on his people as their king. So, chapter 21, we see David's shepherd heart. It begins on a sort of uh, bad note. So, David fell prey to Satan, it says. Um, what happened was David instructed Joab, 
his commander in chief to conduct the consensus of all the fighting men because he wanted to see how powerful he had become and like boast about it. Like I have this many. Um, but then he realized that he sinned. And so he said to God, I have sinned greatly by doing this. Now I beg you, take away the guilt of your servant. I've done a very foolish thing. So in response, God gave him three options, three punishments to choose from. So it's either three years of famine, three months of defeat against enemies, or three days of plague from the Lord. Which one would you choose? Three years of famine, three months of defeat against enemies, or three days of plague from the Lord? Three days. Three days? Three days. Why? For the shortest? Shorter. <laughs> From the Lord, that's correct. So David chose the three days of plague. The idea is they're all equal. Yeah, they're all like fall into the hands of God. That's like you know, that's the scariest actually. Um, but he chose that one because he believed that God's mercy was very great. Amen. So verse fifteen says, and God sent an angel to destroy Jerusalem. But as the angel was doing so. The Lord saw it and was grieved because of the calamity and said to the angel who was destroying the people, Enough! Withdraw your hand. The angel of the Lord was then standing at the threshing floor of Arauna, the Jebusite. So, uh, here I'm reminded of God's intervention um, when Abraham was about to sacrifice Isaac. God said, Stop! And after the flood, God said, Never again. So, we see there's true evidences of God's mercy in the Bible and we see his heart here he is so merciful and he also God himself also feels grief because of our suffering he knows our sins and yet he sympathizes with our pain ultimately he brought about salvation without compromising his justice through his son Jesus Christ he took upon David's sin and my sin and your sin upon himself we see through this event that David's heart grew in God's heart he prayed was it not I who ordered the fighting men to be counted? I am the one who sinned and did wrong. These are but sheep. What have they done? O oh Lord my God, let your hand fall upon me and my family, but do not let this plague remain on your people. Uh, we see this same shepherd heart of David when he formally charged the leaders of Israel and his son Solomon concerning the temple um, at the end of the book and the end of his life. Hmm... Peter, can you read <clears throat> verses 17 to 19? I know, my God, that you test the heart and are pleased with the test I given willingly and with honest intent. And now I have seen with joy how willingly your people who are here have given to you. O Lord, God of our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, keep this desire in the hearts of your people forever, and keep their hearts loyal to you. And give my son Solomon the wholehearted devotion to keep your commands, requirements, and decrees, and to do everything to build the palatial structure for which I have provided. Amen. So, last part is preparations for building the temple. This is the end of First Chronicles. So, because of David's love for God, he was uh, so concerned for the house of God. Um, and because the house of God was a big deal to God, it was a big deal to David. So chapters 22 to 26 give very detailed descriptions of how David organized the priests, the singers. Uh, you'll see music is huge, like music is very important in worship to God. And other um, arrangement of officers and officials. So, um, yes, David makes preparations for the building of the temple versus... Uh, uh, chapter 22, 1 to 5, David charges Solomon with the task, 6 to 16. David charges the leaders of Israel to help Solomon, 17 to 19. Then David organizes the priests, gatekeepers, other officials, and army officials. That takes four <coughs> chapters. And then David formally charges the officials and Solomon concerning the building of the temple in the last chapter. David's personal charge to Solomon shows uh, what he believed to be most important as king. He held to God's promise and was sure to teach his son uh, Solomon of the truth he had learned as king. For example, in uh, chapter 22, 19a and 13, he said to uh, Solomon, Now devote your heart and soul to seeking the Lord your God. 
Then you will have success if you are careful to observe the decrees and laws that the Lord gave Moses for Israel. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. At the end of his life, again, David formally charged Solomon in front of the people to acknowledge God and as his prayer for him to be wholeheartedly devoted to him. So chapter 28, 9 says, And you, my son Solomon, acknowledge the God of your father and serve him with wholehearted devotion and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches every heart and understands every motive behind the thoughts. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will reject you forever. So, um, I actually, uh, that's the conclusion of First Chronicles. And so, I'll, I'll share a little bit of what I learned from First Chronicles. So, First Chronicles uh, uh, describes David's reign very positively to emphasize God's hope of redeeming his people through the Messianic King Jesus. Uh, just as he gave this message to fatalistic and victimized uh, Israel, we actually learned in GLE that the gospel came to Korea at a time when Koreans were similarly dark and fatalistic after years of Japanese occupation and the Korean War. From this uh, context, UBF was born and grew to be a blessing to all nations, a missionary sending nation, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So what was the secret? The secret was the hope of God, Jesus, which is he is, in, he is the gospel. So even though David's time was before Jesus and we are after the time of Jesus, God's hope and redemptive story is the same. Jesus is the hope of God for all people of all nations of all times. In him we find our true identity and we can live out this identity as his chosen people. So how are we to live in light of our um, Savior and King Jesus? Faith in Jesus leads to a transformed heart and a transformed life. We learned that yesterday in Bible study. After we confess Jesus as Christ, there is a change of your direction in life and a change of your heart. We see an example of this life of faith in David in, uh, as recorded in First Chronicles. So to recap, first, um, David concerned himself with God's work and God's kingdom. So, likewise, if we truly love Jesus, we will want to grow in his heart and serve his redemptive work. We will want to tell other people of his gospel and love them. Second, we see an um, example of a uh, very personal and rich prayer life. One that is full of thanksgiving and humility. Whatever David asked was aligned to the will of God that his people might know him and absolutely worship him. <laughs> Finally, David knew how to repent. First Chronicles talked about the time he became proud and ordered a census of all his fighting men. But the last word of this story is David's repentance <coughs> and prayer for his people. So in the same way, uh, of course we are not perfect, but the important thing is the last word is always repentance. In these three clear ways, David exemplifies the life we should live in light of the hope of God, Jesus Christ. As we confess that Jesus is our Christ, may we really seek to live transformed lives with the hope of God, in his shepherd heart, in, in our prayer life, and also in our repentance. In this way, may we truly be raised to be spiritual and gospel-centered leaders like David in his time. Amen. So, um... Let's read the key verse together, and then I'll pray. One, two, three. And when your days are over and you go to be with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, one of your sons, and I will establish his throne forever. Okay. Um, if there's no questions, I'll pray. But if there's questions... So funny when uh, you say the questions, everyone looks down. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no questions. Okay, I'll pray. Okay. Okay. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for Jesus, who is our hope. Lord, uh, when we put our hope in things of this world, uh, they lead to um, very sad. And uh, but Father, when we put our hope in you, against 
all odds. Truly there is victory and there is uh, glory to you. So Father, help us to um, take the step of faith to uh, put our hope in Jesus Christ and to follow him in our practical life, living uh, transformed lives with the Holy Spirit. Father, uh, we are sinful, but uh, Lord, bring us to repentance and faith. Teach us uh, your heart and teach us how to pray. Uh, not selfish prayers, but prayers that are centered on who you are and what you have done so that we can really have thanks and praise uh, in our heart. Uh, Father, um, uh, also please um, help us to love those you have put in our care and uh, really pray for them to be wholeheartedly devoted to you. Father, thank you for uh, blessing this GLE with your presence and your Holy Spirit. I pray you would really empower us, take away all physical tiredness or sickness, and uh, give us a renewed mind and heart to learn uh, from your word, especially in the Bible study coming up. Uh, please be with us to be one in uh, the body of Christ, in heart and mind and spirit. Thank you again for this time and all these things I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you again, Helena. Let's give her a hand. Presentation. So we could learn that David is the foreshadow of Jesus, right? We also saw that the conclusion of um, the Chronicles book is God's hope for each one of us. So one week has passed. Julie, and now I want to ask you guys, are you guys receiving grace through GLE? Amen. Amen. Yes, a lot of grace, right? And I want to think about God's hope for us. So I want to ask you a question. Matthews. <laughs> That's because you're my favorite. Um, who called you? Who invited you to GLE? I mean, there were people involved that called us, that invited us, but the truth is that God called us, invited us. So we have to think, really meditate, what God is wanting to tell us. So we are a couple of days to end, I think four, five days, six days. But this is a very crucial time because we have to make a decision, a personal decision. <clears throat> Otherwise, all of this GLE can be forgotten very easily. You know? So let's really think why God called me here and really focus on the Bible study and think of Jesus. So when He's He's giving the Holy Spirit gives us a direction that we may confess and then we can write that down and then we can apply it, all right? Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I have some announcements here. So, we'll prepare Bible study. We'll give you the question sheets and from 9, 9.45 till 10.15, we'll answer the questions. We'll prepare and then after 10.15 till 11.45, we'll have the Bible studies. And 11.45, we'll meet here again for summary and announcements. Okay? Yes. I will pray. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your hope for each one of us. Uh, 
we are sinners we don't deserve your grace and we don't have anything actually to offer you that you might use for your glory but please accept our heart our humility and our five loaves and two fishes and bless this father uh, this GLE is being blessed abundantly by your Holy Spirit but help us to really embrace uh, Jesus and to have a faith commitment and a life decision so that this GLE may bear many fruits in our lives. Help us also giving your Holy Spirit during Bible study so that we may think and also meditate in Jesus. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.